Uh, hello again. Um, hope things are going well. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, so we've been talking about the WKB method, uh, and in the previous uh, two or three videos, we we discussed how we can use it to analyze a boundary uh, layer phenomenon. Um, but uh, in the introduction to the WKB method, we also sort of talked about how it can be used for um, other kinds of phenomenon, which are called dispersive phenomenon or wave-like phenomenon. Um, so, uh, so maybe it's a good idea to try try out an example which occurs quite commonly in physics, in particular, which is uh, to look at an equation uh, of the form uh, which we can generically call a Schrodinger-like equation. Um, uh, so, for instance, if we uh, look at an equation of the form, um, say uh, epsilon y double prime equals q x y uh, in the region where let's say q x is non-zero. Okay, so again, uh, <coughs> y is the uh, dependent variable. Um, epsilon is a small parameter. We just take it to be a small parameter, um, and uh, prime is a derivative with respect to the, the independent variable x. So, uh, so one of the differences between this equation and the one we have been considering before is that this doesn't have a, a term that uh, it doesn't have a term which is a single derivative of y. So we don't have a y prime term. So we just have y double prime and y. Um, and, and for instance, if uh, and, and the other difference is that we are also considering q to be a function of x. So as we talked about in the introduction to the WKB method, um, it could be used to solve uh, linear differential equations of any order, um, even when the coefficients of the equation, uh, coefficients appearing in the equation, um, are depend upon the independent variable. So, so in this case, we'll take q in general to be a function of x, uh, with the only stipulation that it's non-zero, um, <coughs> and um, so, uh, so for instance, let's say if q x was a negative constant, uh, then you can see that this will give some kind of an oscillatory solution. Um, so, so and 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 one of the reasons and the reason for calling this a Schrodinger-like equation is because uh, if you if you've like worked with uh, quantum mechanics, then uh, the time uh, the time independent Schrodinger's equation. One of the ways of expressing it is uh, h bar uh, square two m, and then uh, d to psi dx square equals uh, the potential vx minus the energy times psi of x, right? So, uh, so if we sort of uh, suitably non-dimensionalize this equation, um, we can think of this as the qx that we are writing times psi, and then it might happen that you have a small parameter here, epsilon, and then uh, we can write this as psi double prime. Right, so this is exactly the kind of equation we're looking at, and that's the reason we can think of this as uh, the time-independent Schrodinger uh, kind of equation, uh, subject to some boundary conditions which we are not specifying as yet. We just need to we we we'll just try and work out what the uh, j uh, how we can get a solution to this equation using a WKB kind of method for any choice of qx. Uh, so. Uh, so again, uh, if we are looking for a WKB kind of solution, uh, the basic idea is that we make an ansatz for the solution of the form y is e to the power of some function s0 delta plus s1x plus higher order terms. And for the purpose of this example, uh, let's restrict ourselves to just calculating the, the two leading order terms, S0 and S1x, uh, which is what we described in one of the previous videos as the physical optic approximation. Um, and, and, and again, there's this small parameter delta, which goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And we need to figure out the dependent, how delta depends on epsilon using methods similar to the method of dominant balance. Um, so actually, let's do that uh, first. Uh, now, in this case, it's particularly interesting and easy because we just have two terms. And, and in the method of dominant balance, we are typically looking for two terms that are balancing each other. So if we do, uh, if we repeat the arguments uh, that, we, uh, that, that we did last time, which is to rescale x uh, and define a new variable, x tilde, which goes as x divided by delta, uh, then y prime is 1 over or rather dy dx tilde is 1 over delta dy dx and uh, so we worked this out in one of the previous videos I'll put a link if you want to review this and then uh, d2 y dx uh, tilde square um, 
or, or rather sorry dy dx is 1 over delta dy dx tilde and d2y dx square is 1 over delta square uh, d2y dx tilde square right this is just this is follows from the chain rule um, and so if you make this substitution into this equation uh, we'll find that uh, epsilon uh, well, divided by delta square so this is now rewriting this equation in terms of the variable x tilde uh, we find t 2 y uh, d x tilde square equals q um, times x tilde delta times y okay so uh, so again we just have two terms and it's um, it's like it's, it's likely that these two balance each other out in and especially we are considering the cases where q itself is non-zero and so uh, one way to achieve this balance is to simply make delta square scale as epsilon which means delta scales as epsilon to the power of half okay so we take this to be our um, uh, this this to be the this to be the this is how delta depends upon the small parameter epsilon um, and so when we make this ansatz we can take delta to be scaling so up this, this is true up to some constant but we we can simply set delta equals epsilon to the power of half um, in this expansion and work out what uh, and, and so now we need to work out what s naught and s1 are um, so let's do that now uh, So, uh, so again, uh, we need to calculate the, dub, the y double prime for this particular ansatz. And again, we we this, did this kind of calculation in the previous video. So, I'll put a link. Uh, just, to, but we could go through it again quickly. So, um, the first derivative y of prime will be um, the same exponential factor, which is e to the power of s naught delta plus s one times the derivative of these terms with respect to x which will give us s naught prime delta plus s1 prime and then y double prime will be uh, e s naught divided by delta plus s1 and then we have a square of this term which will give us s naught prime divided by delta plus s1 prime square plus we'll have a uh, derivative of this particular factor which will give us s naught uh, double prime divided by delta plus s1 double prime okay uh, so this y double prime we need to substitute it into the equation and y we substitute into this equation and notice that we have this common factor exponential e to the power of s naught divided by delta plus s1 appearing in, in front of both this and this so these cancel out uh, so the overall expression that we have is epsilon times y double prime and now we can square these terms so this will give us s naught prime square divided by delta square plus s1 prime square plus 2 s naught prime s1 prime divided by delta plus the double derivative terms s naught prime delta plus s1 double prime equals q of x right uh, so under the assumption that delta scale as epsilon to the power of half, we notice that this term is actually of order 1 because this will be epsilon divided by delta square times s naught prime square, but delta square scales linearly with epsilon. So overall we have this term as of order 1 and on the right hand side we have q of x which we will uh, which we'll take which we which we'll take to be the dominant term on the right hand side of order one. So these two balance each other, which is how we obtain the scaling in the first place. So to order zero, order epsilon to the power of zero, we have the match uh, s naught prime square equals qx. Uh, the next order term will be epsilon divided by delta. Uh, epsilon divided by delta would scale as um, square root of epsilon so that's our next order term epsilon to the power of half and this will give us 2 s naught prime s1 prime and then this term also scales with epsilon to the power of half plus s naught double prime and there's nothing on the right hand side that scales similarly this term scales as 
linearly in epsilon and this term scales linearly in epsilon so, so those will be uh, those will be order epsilon to the power of 1 which we can ignore for now so we have these two relations to determine the leading order function s0 s0 and s1 right so we need to uh, integrate this to find out s0 and then we can use plug it into this expression to find out what s1 is okay so uh, let's try that out um, So uh, this quantity uh, S0 prime square gives us S0 prime is plus minus plus or minus square root of u of x. Uh, and this we can integrate to write S0 is the integral of this expression which is plus minus integral over some interval x square root of q with respect to some dummy variable qs ds. So that gives us, uh, for any arbitrary function qx non-zero, it gives us s0 as the integral of the square root of the function q. Um, and we can use that to determine what s1 is. So s1 prime is minus s0 double prime divided by uh, 2 s0 prime. Right. Um, so we already know what s0 prime is and we need to figure out what s0 double prime will be. So um, we can do a quick cal calculation here. So given this is s0 prime, s0 double prime is uh, plus minus half square root of qx times the derivative of q, q prime x. Right. Uh, so we can just substitute this expression here. And so notice there's a minus here. So minus times plus or minus will give us a minus or plus. And then we have Q prime divided by, there's a factor of two here and there's a factor of two that gives us a factor of four. Then S naught prime uh, has a plus, sorry, there'll be a minus. Uh, so S naught prime, S naught prime also has a plus or a minus and a square root QX. So this square root Q QX uh, gets multiplied by this square root qx to give us a qx and then uh, we have a factor uh, plus or minus appearing in front here so um, maybe. so there's a 4 and then there's a plus or minus so which means that when this is minus this is plus and when this is plus this is minus so overall the sign will be just a minus so this gives us minus uh, q prime divided by 4 q that's s1 prime okay so now we need to integrate this um, so uh, we have d s1 dx equals minus 1 over 4 uh, times q d q1 d q dx. So if we, uh, if we do a separation of variables or rather if we mo move dx on the other side, we can write this as this integral and then we need to integrate both sides. So no, notice this is dq dx and there's a dx. So we can get rid of these factors and simply integrate dq divided by q. And this gives us s1 is um, minus one over four log natural q plus some constant. So that's our s1 and we know our s0. Um, that's our s0. Okay, so notice that s1 is has just one value which is minus 1 over 4 log natural q whereas s0 has two values plus or minus. So our overall solution will be a linear superposition of uh, the two, two solutions we have obtained from here uh, which means we can express y as uh, y as a constant c1 
times e to the power of uh, remember the answers that we used were s0 divided by delta plus s1 um, so we have s0 the first s0 is plus delta is square root epsilon which is what we figured out so epsilon to the power of half and then integral over x of qs ds right and then we have this factor minus 1 over 4 log natural q plus there is a constant which we can just absorb in this constant c1 and then there's another term c2 which is e to the power of minus which is com which comes from the second solution minus here minus 1 over um, let's just write this as a square root here square root epsilon then integral over x square root qs ds and the same factor minus uh, 1 over 4 log natural q um, now notice that there is this common factor so the, this is this entire term is in the exponential now in these two there is a common factor which is minus 1 over 4 log natural q and since we have an exponential uh, recall that e to the power of um, minus 1 over 4 log natural q can be written as or if we have a minus if we have minus 1 over 4 in front of the log natural we can raise q to the power of minus 1 to the power of 4 and we can write this as log natural q to the power of minus 1 divided by 4 and there's an exponential raised to the power of log and that gives us q to the power of minus 1 over 4. So this factor can be simplified further and we can write a complete solution as y is c1 uh, we can take we can we can express this particular factor in this form so we have q of x to the power of minus 1 over 4 and then we have e to the power of square root epsilon integral over x qs ds plus a, the second solution which again has this factor so qx minus 1 over 4 and then we have an exponential minus of this factor minus 1 square root q epsilon qs ds which okay so this is our complete solution um, and if we are specified, if we are given two boundary conditions, we can solve for the constant C1 and C2. Um, so, uh, so this is quite uh, useful. And uh, in the next part of the video, we can what we can do is we can take a specific example, uh, a simple, very simple example where Qx is a constant, uh, say minus one, and that will give us some oscillatory solutions. And we can see how our WKB solution that we have obtained compares with the exact solution because in that case when qx is a constant we can also solve for the exact solution um, so so let's try and try that out in the next part of the video see you there thanks